So, okay, everyone, welcome to today's webinar, The Foreign Domestic Workers Guide to COVID-19 Vaccines in Hong Kong, Should I Get Vaccinated? I'm Ingrid Loy, a research assistant at the School of Public Health at the University of Hong Kong, and I'm one of the organizers of today's event. This event was also organized by the Asian Migrant Coordinating Body, Domestic Workers Corner, and Gabriella Hong Kong. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's event will be in English. The webinar will last for about 45 minutes with 15 minutes at the end reserved for Q&A. If you have any questions at any time, please feel free to leave them in the Q&A or chat below if you're joining us on Zoom, or if you're joining us from AMCB's Facebook page, you can leave your comments in the comment section below and we will have someone monitoring that video. This event is being recorded to be uploaded on another video platform at a later date with translated subtitles. This recording will only be of today's speakers, so no attendee will be voice recorded or named. We have an exciting lineup of speakers with us today, so I'm very happy to introduce them all to you. First, we have Dr. Sudar Shuda, a clinical assistant professor from the Department of Microbiology at HKU, who will talk a little bit about how the COVID-19 vaccines work. We also have Professor Ben Cowling, the head of the Division of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the School of Public Health at HKU, who will speak to the importance of getting vaccinated. We will also have Sheila Trevia Bonifacio, the chairperson of Gabriella Hong Kong, who will share her experience of what it was like to get vaccinated and discuss the situation for Filipinos and domestic workers specifically. Finally, as some of you may know, we released a survey earlier this week asking for foreign domestic workers thoughts on the COVID-19 vaccine. Rodelia Pedro Villar, the founder of Domestic Workers Corner, will summarize the results of this survey. By the end of this online seminar, we hope that you will be able to have a better understanding of the COVID-19 vaccines that are currently available in Hong Kong, understand the benefits and potential risks that of vaccination, and get answers to many of the most critical issues related to vaccination in Hong Kong. Finally, we hope that you will feel empowered to make decisions regarding vaccination. Now, I don't want to take up any more of the very limited time that we have today. So Dr. Shadar, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ingrid. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen. I hope you can see that okay. So let me begin. Right, um, so over the next 10 minutes, I'm just gonna go very briefly over what we mean when we talk about vaccines and uh, how the COVID-19 vaccines that we have available actually work. So, what actually is a vaccine? Um, our immune system is a wonderful thing. It's able to respond to infections by generating an immune response, right? This immune response helps in two ways. It helps you clear the infection, but it also means that your immune system has a memory of the bacteria or virus or whatever was infecting you. So in case you encounter it again in the future, you have protection you have uh, an immune mediated protection against a re-challenge by the same pathogen in the future. So, um, you know, we come into contact with a wide variety of infections throughout our life. So we have common things like chicken pox, we have common things like, uh, um, you know, measles or uh, influenza going around all the time, all around the world. And when our body comes in contact with them, we form, um, an immune response and an important component of that are antibodies. The problem with COVID-19 is that it's a completely new virus. So when it first came out at the uh, beginning of the pandemic, um, humanity had never seen this virus before. So we were actually not uh, prepared for it in a way. Our immune systems had never encountered um, the COVID-19 virus before. So uh, that means that it basically caused a pandemic. It spread uh, very widely. It spread very quickly. It caused a lot of uh, mortality worldwide. Now, apart from getting the infection itself, are there any other ways of actually getting an immune response to COVID-19? The answer is vaccination, right? So the idea behind vaccination is really simple. What we do is we take a small part of the virus, of the COVID-19 virus in question here, 
and we basically inject it into people and our immune response responds to that vaccine as if it's responding to the virus itself and it forms an immune response. So the next time you actually encounter, if you know, after getting the vaccine, you actually come in contact with the virus itself, you have a bit of protection against the virus and that's how vaccination works. So what we're doing is we're taking a little bit of the virus and we're injecting into our cells and the hope is that we develop an immune response against the virus. So in case we actually come in contact with it in later life, we have some degree of protection against it and that's what vaccination is all about. But um, there are many different types of vaccines and in Hong Kong, we have two main vaccines and it's really important to know which is which so uh, that you don't get confused between the two, right? So these are the two vaccines you're going to, you, you've been hearing a lot about in the news. So the first one is CoronaVac and it's manufactured by uh, Sinovac. So this is from China. And the second is Comirnaty, which is produced by a company called BioNTech and is distributed by uh, basically Fosun Pharma, right? So these are the two vaccines we have available. The CoronaVac vaccine is an, it is an inactivated vaccine. The community vaccine is something that we call an mRNA vaccine. And I'll go into a little bit of detail about what these terms actually mean in my next slides. In terms of efficacy, that is how effective that they are in protecting against uh, COVID-19 that actually makes you ill, that actually gives you symptoms. CoronaVac is about 50.7% uh, effective according to the phase three trial. And the BioNTech vaccine is about 95% effective. Now, these figures refer to all forms of symptomatic COVID-19. Of course, uh, the figures are higher against severe COVID-19, which I'm sure we'll also go into in the remaining parts of the seminar. Right, so how do these vaccines actually work? The first type of vaccine is uh, or, uh, that I'm going to talk about is the CoronaVac vaccine. So remember that that is the Chinese vaccine that's made by Sinovac. It's a very simple concept. All we do is we grow the virus in the laboratory and then we kill the virus. So we use a particular kind of chemical that is lethal to the virus. So the virus is no longer alive. It can't infect people anymore. We then take this killed virus preparation and we inject it into people. And it's as simple as that. The body then detects that dead body of the virus inside our muscle, right? And produces an immune response to it. And that is basically how um, CoronaVac works. Now, um, the thing about this type of vaccine is we have a really long track record of using these type of vaccines. And I mean, if you have received uh, inactivated polio vaccines or hepatitis A vaccine, they're basically using the very, very similar kind of te technology or very similar concept. You take the virus, you kill it, and you inject it into people. So, um, that is basically the principle behind the Sinovac vaccine. Now, the other type of vaccine, uh, which is the BioNTech vaccine, is a little bit newer, right? So I'm going to have to explain it in a little bit more detail. Here, we're not taking the virus itself, but we're taking a part of the genes of the virus. So the COVID-19 virus actually has many genes, just like humans have many genes, right? COVID-19 has quite a few genes of its own. We take one particular genetic fragment of the virus and we basically package it in some um, particles and inject it into people. Then the genes forms a small fragment of the virus in the muscle, not the entire virus. It doesn't infect us per se. It just expresses a small fragment of the viral protein and our immune systems respond to that. So in effect, it's as if we are being exposed to a part of the virus and we are able to form a strong immune response to that, which basically um, is, 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 is very effective at protecting us from the real thing. So when we encounter the actual virus in the future, uh, the immune response that is produced by this vaccine is able to protect us against that. Now, um, it's a relatively newer technology. I mean, when I say new, we have actually been playing around with this for the last two decades and there are many other vaccines against uh, uh, infectious diseases based on mRNA technology that are in early phase clinical trials. And we've been talking about this idea for the last uh, seven to 10 years, but this is really the first time it's being used on a large scale. Compared to um, 
CoronaVac, I would say the side effects are pretty similar, but one important thing is uh, I, we do hear of people getting more local pains or uh, uh, tiredness or muscle aches after receiving the mRNA vaccine, perhaps compared to the CoronaVac vaccine, but all in all, an extremely safe vaccine and also very effective. One thing, last thing that I'd really like to address is that the mRNA vaccines do not change your DNA. So this is a rumor that you hear a lot about on uh, social media about vaccines changing your DNA and things like that. There is basically no viable way by which mRNA vaccines can actually mess around with the person's DNA. So you don't have to worry about COVID-19 vaccines affecting DNA in any way, okay? So that's the important thing. So in summary, vaccines are basically parts or, or, or an inactivated form of the virus that we can put in ourselves to produce an immune response that protects us when we actually encounter the pathogen in life. And the two types of vaccines we have in Hong Kong are inactivated vaccines and mRNA vaccines. Inactivated vaccines are uh, basically a very traditional form of technology, right? And they are, there's basically what is being used in Sinovac's CoronaVac and the mRNA vaccine is a relatively newer technology, but also, also safe and effective as far as evidence to date suggests. And it's and a good example of this technology is BioNTech. So I don't want to overrun. If there are any questions that you might have about how vaccines work, etc., feel free to ask me in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very quick and I think very informative as well. And I know that a lot of people had questions about that. So I'd like to quickly hand things over to Professor Cowling. Muted. Thanks very much. I'm Ben Cowling. I'm a professor here in Hong Kong at the School of Public Health at the University of Hong Kong. So the, the first thing I wanted to mention is that COVID is not the same as flu. Sometimes it's compared with flu, but it's actually very different and it's much more serious. If you get flu, sometimes it can be a nasty infection. Sometimes you can be pretty ill, need to stay in bed for, for a day or two. And flu kills people every year. COVID is 10 to 20 times worse than flu in all ages. Uh, on the figure here is the United States. The, uh, looking at how many deaths are caused every year in the United States by flu, in yellow at the very bottom. And then on the right-hand side in blue is the past year, what's happened in the United States with COVID. It's had an enormous impact. Um, and that's because unlike flu, everybody is vulnerable to COVID because we don't have any pre-existing immunity and because COVID infections are more serious. Now in Hong Kong, we've done pretty well with COVID in the past year. We've managed to keep the numbers of cases very low. We've done that with uh, a lot of testing, isolation of cases and tracing and quarantine of their contacts in Penny's Bay and other places. We've also had social distancing in the community. Everybody's wearing masks in public. We have uh, uh, heavy restrictions on people coming into Hong Kong and now a 21 day quarantine for people that arrive. So we've had a lot of measures in place which have kept us safe from COVID, but we don't want those measures to continue forever. In fact, relax the measures as soon as possible. I know many people would like to be able to travel overseas without having the quarantine when they come back. Uh, a lot of people would like the social distancing to, to be relaxed so they can have gatherings with larger numbers of people and maybe so we don't have to wear masks anymore. So we can achieve that by replacing all of those public health measures with vaccination. Now, I wanna follow on from, from Sid's talk to, to mention the idea of how vaccines work in general so I've got a little diagram here. There's a, a healthy lady on the left and then it's changed to a man in the middle. Sorry, that's, that's not a sick person, let's say, in the middle. And then on the right is a very, very sick person. And so what happens with infections, whether it's COVID, whether it's flu, whether it's another infection, the first step that happens is that you get infected with that, with that disease. Maybe you get some symptoms. And then a, a subsequent step is that the disease might get worse. It might not, it might be mild, it might get worse. And so one way that vaccines work is by stopping an infection from occurring full stop. So for some diseases, for some types of vaccines, they'll prevent an infection from occurring 
in the first place. That's an infection limiting vaccine. And it's great because if you don't get infected, then you certainly can't get very sick because you weren't even infected. There is another type of vaccine for some diseases, uh, and that's a vaccine where it maybe doesn't stop you from getting infected, or maybe doesn't work that well at stopping you from getting infected. But if you were to get infected, it would prevent you from getting the more severe form of the disease. And so that's a disease limiting vaccine, or a vaccine that has a disease limiting effect. And we've also heard from time to time in, in recent months, the question of whether vaccines can limit transmission. And so what I would say to that is if a vaccine can stop a person from being infected with a virus like COVID, then it's certainly going to stop transmission of that infection. If a, a vaccine can stop disease, if it can be a, a vaccine that limits severe disease, it may not have as much effect on transmission. It may have some effect on transmission, but not so much. So how do the two vaccines that we have in Hong Kong uh, shape up? So I, I put my stars on here. I get my star rating for the two vaccines. So firstly, the Cominati, the BioNTech vaccine. I think that's a five-star vaccine against infection. I don't, think we, I don't think we could do much better than the Cominati vaccine in stopping infection. And of course, because it stops infection, it's also going to very, very effectively stop severe disease. So people who receive the Cominati vaccine will, will have a much, much, much lower chance to get uh, severe COVID, to get the, the symptoms that we've heard about sometimes, the, the difficulty breathing uh, and need for specialist care in the hospital. Now for CoronaVac, it's not quite so good at limiting infection. I've only given it three stars here, not five stars, only three stars, because we saw in the previous talk from Sid that the effectiveness against mild disease, uh, and that would include mild infections, of course, the, the effectiveness is only about 50%, but it is still very effective against severe disease. So how does that then play out for, for maybe our individual choices or for also when we think about what the government's recommending uh, to do? So I think there are, there are two possible strategies that we can consider ourselves and also the government can consider us to, to, to follow when we think about COVID-19. And I've, I've given them numbers one and number, oh, number one and number one, sorry. It should be number one and number two. So number one, is protect yourself. Um, let me fix it on this slide. Um, sorry, otherwise it's going to be confusing. Okay. So number one, protect yourself. And if you want to protect yourself against COVID, you should definitely get vaccinated and you can choose Cominati, you can choose Sinovac because both of them will protect you against severe disease. Uh, if you were to get a mild infection, it probably wouldn't be a big deal. What we've heard about with the, with the Sinovac vaccine, the Coronavac vaccine made by Sinovac, some people may still get mild, mild infection, mild, mild symptoms, but nothing too serious. So that's great. You've protected yourself by being vaccinated. And a government that wants to follow this strategy would encourage everybody to get vaccinated. It's every person for themselves. So prioritize vaccination firstly for the highest risk people, that's the elderly, the people with underlying health conditions, heart disease or whatever, and then gradually going to the whole population. And we've seen a lot of parts of the world going for this to try and get as many people as possible covered. The second possible strategy, I would call it protect yourself and the people around you. And the way that we'll try and achieve that is by using vaccines that are really good at limiting infection because if people can't get infected, they can't spread the infection to the people around them. And I think if we were going for that strategy, we'd have to really prioritize and prefer using Cominati. That's the BioNTech vaccine, because it's, I give it a five-star rating against infection. So people that are worried about those around them, for example, if you live with elderly people uh, who maybe they're not suitable to get vaccinated, or maybe they don't want to get vaccinated, then really, if you were to get the BioNTech vaccine, you could at least provide some indirect protection to them, because by having that vaccine, you are then much, much less likely to get infected. It's almost impossible, actually, to get infected. Really, really unlikely. And so you wouldn't be the person that brings infection into the home and transmits it to, the, to your family members or, or the people that you're living with. Um, and of course, your, your friends as well. 
uh, in the future, I think we will face a higher risk of COVID than we faced in the past year. So one of the reasons that I've heard people talking about not wanting to get vaccinated is because in Hong Kong, we've only had 10,000 cases in the past year. Uh, so there's been a very, very low risk. So we don't need to worry about COVID. But that, that's not going to stay the, the case for forever. Uh, we may have a higher risk of COVID in the coming year. There may be more infections in the community, even within the next few weeks or the next few months. And so there will be a risk and we will benefit from vaccination by being protected against COVID. And of course, if we travel to other parts of the world, if we travel to, for example, the Philippines or Indonesia or Malaysia or Thailand or, or other places where there's infections in the community, uh, we really like to be protected against COVID and then be, be more reassured that we're not gonna get infected and we're not gonna suffer from, from COVID, which can be a nasty infection. So I'll, I'll finish there and pass back to Ingrid. Great, thank you so much. So I will pass it over to Sheila. Okay, um, good day everyone. I'm Sheila Bonifacio and on behalf of Gabriela Hong Kong and Asian Migrants Coordinating Body or AMCB IMA Hong Kong and Macau, I would like to thank Karen and Ingrid for inviting us today to partner in this forum. Before I answer the question, the question, why is it like to get the vaccine? I will give you, maybe I will give you a short context of what is the general situations of migrants and the impact of COVID to us. So when the pandemic started, the migrants were one of the first to be hit by its impact, not only on health, but also on our working conditions and our families back home. Most of us migrant workers are the breadwinners of our family. So because of the pandemic, the situation in most of our home countries being locked down without sufficient support from the government and our family needs more financial support from us. So more than a year now here in Hong Kong, we are fighting COVID. We name it COVID for us to stand with the C as coronavirus, O as overwork, V as vulnerability, I as inequality, and D as discrimination. Since the start, we have been facing various forms of discrimination and it has intensified during the COVID. Early in 2020, the Asian Migrants Coordinating Body made a survey on what are the impacts of COVID to migrants. And based on that survey, more than half of the respondents reported that they work more in the past months than before. Like 80% reported more cleaning, 50% reported more cooking, 30% reported more time for child caring, 15% reported more tasks of going out to buy product. Given that the migrants play an important role in Hong Kong society in taking care of the Hong Kong family. We have been taking, taken on the extra task of cleaning and keeping the families we work with safe. We should have been included in protections and social support. But instead, we are consistently subject to exclusion and discrimination in terms of Hong Kong government protection measures in combating impact of COVID-19. The Labor Department suggested once to employers to not allow their domestic workers to go out during Sunday in fear of getting infected. But does the virus only infect domestic workers during Sunday? No? Because every day from Monday to Saturday, we are doing errands outside as part of our job. Why not allow us to take a break from the extra workload we are working the whole week because of the pandemic. Even the washing machine will mal malfunction when it's overloaded. How much more are human? So maybe some, some are not aware, but migrant workers are often multitasking just to ensure that the needs of the family that we are working with will be cared for every day. We're, we're also excluded in financial assistance during pandemic. Hong Kong immigration maliciously 
accuses us of job hopping, resulting to more than 300 migrants denied visa application in the first two months of 2021. So those are just a few examples of discrimination towards migrants, especially during COVID-19. That's why the question, what is it like to get the vaccine, is actually for us is a relief and a big help for us to feel relieved and secure and significantly lowering the risk of having infection and affecting our work, even if, it, even if vaccines are not 100%. Because ever since the start, um, we are fearful of getting infected and getting terminated. Because as I mentioned, our families back home rely on us. In this time, we really need to be healthy and protected. We wish the same health and protection for our families. Unfortunately, this wish is often not a reality. For example, my family in in the Philippines also wishes to get vaccinated for their protection. But unfortunately, the Philippines' response to COVID is quite backward. My family is again now being locked down. Uh, one year later, without access to mass testing, without work, and without economic support from the Philippine government, which is, is the government's responsibility. We migrants are always worried with with their conditions. That's why we're welcoming the action of the Hong Kong government to include us migrant workers in the priority group who will have access to receive vaccines. We are also hopefully employers and the Hong Kong um, government will not make it as a mandatory for, for, for their workers to be vaccinated as a requirement to continuing their employment contract. We do believe people should make informed decisions. Still, many migrants are worried about being vaccinated because of rumors about the effect of vaccines in their body. We're glad that the Hong Kong University um, have this initiative of giving us proper information coming from medical experts on about what is vaccine and what is the effect and benefits. It helped our migrants community to understand the importance of this vaccine and make informed decisions. Again, on behalf of the Asian Migrants Coordinating Body and Gabriela Hong Kong, thank you for having us and have a good day. Thank you for working with us. We are very excited to be able to partner with you and with Rodelia as well. Uh, Sheila, have you talked about your experience of getting vaccinated? I think you're muted. It? Hello? Yeah. Hi. Have you spoken about your experience of getting vaccinated? Well, I, I already have my second dose last last week and it feels good. You no, know? though there's some slight um reactions on my body. But as I said, we need it. We need the the protections and we at least for now feel secure of having risk to have infected because that's what we are afraid of. Because if we got um, infected, then it will result for uh, more um, trouble for us because we might get um, terminated. And if that happened, so economically we are affected because our family right now during the pandemic only rely on us. So. Yeah, we feel good about uh, the vaccinations and we encourage our, our fellow migrant workers to, to try to be vaccinated. Great, thank you so much. So I do see that there are questions in the chat. Thank you for everyone asking questions. We will get to all of your questions later, but for now I'd like to pass it over to Rodelia to talk a little bit about the survey that we put out this week. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rodelia from Domestic Workers Corner. So um, let me begin by thanking Hong Kong University, Public Health, Asian Migrant Coordinating Body, and Gabriela Hong Kong for facilitating this live, and to our two special guests and speaker rather. So thank you everyone who participated in the survey. 99.6% are Filipinos and 4% Indonesians. 
were curious to know about uh, to know more about this uh, the vaccine. According to our survey, 39.6 are willing to get vaccinated, so this is quite good. And 30.4 percent had already been oculated, and 16.1 were still unsure about it. And 13. Uh, 13 percent don't want to take it so we still have encouraged this 13 percent so 76 percent of the correspondents who either had the vaccine or is willing to get it said that they wanted to protect themselves again against covid 40, 44 percent said that they wanted to protect their loved ones and also 50.5 percent would like to travel soon i think i know this one is they want to go home to be with their families and 43.3 took it to avoid being in quarantine and 62.2 would like to um would like their lives to return to normal so this one is uh, they can vote uh not uh they can click not only once and or twice because uh, the the percentage is more than 100 percent so um, because of the nature of our job, our employers play a vital role when it comes to our health. Fortunately, 84.7 of them give autonomy to their helpers. 13.8% of the employers haven't had a talk about the vaccination yet with their helpers and merely 1% of employers require their helpers to get the vaccine. While there are many who are willing to get vaccinated, we have 39 correspondents who are against it. A majority of them is 48.7% are worried about the vaccine side effects. 10.3% thinks that the vaccine won't work. 33.3% have health issues. And 77 stated that their families are concerned about, to get, about getting this vaccine. Plus, 5.1% said, uh, said that their employers won't allow them to get vaccinated. So I think we also encourage employers with this, in this part. Yeah, so we have lots of apprehensions about the COVID vaccine. Questions like, how does the vaccine work? Is it really safe? Who should get it? And what are the risks in getting the vaccine? So we will include this in the question and answer. And thank you so much, everyone. Back to you, Ingrid. Great, thank you so much. So that actually went a lot faster than I thought. So thank you everyone for speaking both so broadly and also so quickly. So now I am going to pass it over to Dr. Karen Greffin, my supervisor and the person who will be moderating our Q&A session today. As a reminder, if you have any questions at any time, please feel free to leave them. If you're on Zoom in the Q&A or the chat box down below, or if you're joining us on the AMCB Facebook live stream, you can also leave it in the comment section and we will be monitoring that as well. So Dr. Greffin, over to you. Great, so thanks so much to everyone for joining us today. I have received a number of questions and as Ingrid says, I am monitoring both the chat in Zoom as well as the chat on Facebook. So if you have any additional questions, please ask them now and I will get those to the speakers as soon as I can. So Chin has asked us, uh, she wants to know whether or not the vaccine is actually safe for everyone. Uh, for example, is it safe for people who have heart disease? Would one of our medical uh, experts want to take this one on? Sid, you Should I take this one? Oh. Yeah, uh, basically anybody who's eligible to get a COVID-19 vaccine as far as age is concerned, and as long as they don't have allergic reactions to vaccine components, and um, at the moment, as long as they're not pregnant, um, is recommended to do so. Like if you have an underlying medical condition, whatever it may be, you know, whether it's heart disease, diabetes, uh, whatever, what really matters is whether it's stable. So if you have a chronic medical condition, if you are keeping it under control, if your blood pressure is under control, your heart, uh, you know, you're not having a, a very, very acute attack of uh, heart failure, you can still go ahead and get the vaccine. So the most important thing is that your health status at the time of receiving the vaccine is reasonably stable. If it's stable, no problem. You can actually go ahead and get the vaccine. 
So Sid, while, while you're answering that, Maria has asked us whether or not it would make sense for people to go and seek uh, medical advice, for example, get a checkup before deciding to get the vaccine. Um, actually, there's no need. If, if you have had good past health all along, if you, you, know, if, if you don't have any um, particular symptoms or uh, reasons to seek medical attention, there is no reason to actually get a checkup before getting the vaccination. Just make your appointment and uh, go ahead. If you do have a chronic medical condition, I mean, if you've been on the same blood pressure pill or diabetes pill for a long period of time and everything is stable, it's also fine. You don't need to seek a doctor's appointment to go ahead and get the vaccine. But if, if, you know, if you're feeling something, if you're feeling something's not right with your body, if you're having any kind of symptoms, or let's say your blood pressure or diabetes is really not under control, then it would probably make sense to seek a, um, you know, doctor's opinion to get that under control before you actually go and get the vaccine. And also if you're having an acute infection of any kind, it probably makes sense to settle that first before you go and get the vaccine because your immune system is busy dealing with other stuff. So just, just as long as you're, you don't have any physical complaints or symptoms, there's no reason to um, you know, go out and get a medical consultation before getting your jab. Great, thanks. So um, a couple of people have asked the question, is it really safe? So we've heard a lot in the news uh, recently about potential uh, uh, side effects. We've heard a lot about people potentially ended up in the hospital afterwards. What do we think about the safety of the different various vaccines that are available here in Hong Kong? So I could say something for this, Karen. Um, when vaccines are first developed, they're tested initially in small groups of people and then larger groups. And for the, the two vaccines we have in Hong Kong, they were both tested in clinical trials with tens of thousands of people to make sure that they're not only effective, but they're also safe. Now, of course, if there's something more rare, for example, something that only happens for one in every 100,000 people who get vaccinated, we wouldn't see that in a clinical trial that only has 10,000, 20,000 people in it because it's too rare. So what happens after vaccines are used with mass vaccination campaigns is that public health authorities will monitor what happens to people after vaccination and keep an eye out if there's anything unusual. And actually we've seen with the AstraZeneca vaccine and then late, uh, lately with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that a very rare type of blood clot was picked up with the incidence of about one in every 200 or 300,000 people who were vaccinated. It's extremely rare. It wouldn't have happened in the clinical trials because it was too rare, but now it's been picked up. And I think because we've heard about that, we can also be confident that the vaccines we're using here, the BioNTech vaccine and the Sinovac vaccine, haven't had anything similar reported, but they've been under the same kind of monitoring practices in the countries that they're being used. So for example, in the US, they found the issue with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. There's been nothing similar reported with the BioNTech vaccine. So we can be reassured that there's really nothing to worry about, even a very, very rare effect. It hasn't been seen in the millions or tens of millions of people that have received this vaccine already. And so I, I think we can be very confident that these vaccines are not only effective, but they're also very, very safe. Excellent, thank you so much. So this is a question for anybody on the panel who has received their vaccines already. What does it feel like? And uh, have you yourselves experienced any types of side effects? So for me, I can share, uh, I really hate needles actually. And I don't normally mention it, but the first time I got vaccinated, the first dose, I did it in, in the Appalachian Health Center and I was fine. I, I was really nervous about the whole thing. I went in, I got the jab, I went to sit down in the, in the waiting area and then I fainted. It wasn't a reaction to the vaccine. It was my, like a panic attack about the whole experience that I'd managed to hold it together. And then about five minutes after the needle, I just, I don't know, adrenaline kicked in or whatever and I just fainted and uh, someone caught me luckily. Um, it's not the first time it's happened to me after getting vaccinated. Uh, it's happened pretty much every time I've had a vaccine since I was a child. Uh, so it's not something I'm really uh, kind of proud to share. It's a little bit embarrassing. So when I went back for my second dose, they actually let me lie down. I think they recognized me that the nurse in charge said, I remember you from last time. You better lie down this time because we don't want you fainting again. And then it was fine. 
So the experience with the needle was totally fine. But um, after the first dose, had a bit of shoulder pain, a bit of arm pain. After the second dose, the same, a little bit of pain, not too bad. And the second 24 hours. So a day after I got vaccinated, I had a little bit of fever, maybe feverish, not exactly a fever, but just felt a little bit feverish, a bit of chills. Uh, and that was yesterday. I had my second dose on Friday. Yesterday, I was a little bit feverish. Today, I'm fine again. So I've done okay. And um, I think that's the same with a lot of other people, that the second dose, you have a little bit of a stronger reaction, but uh, it's over within a day or two. Sid, I know you've had two doses as well. Yeah, um, I didn't actually feel the needle going in. So I guess the technique of the people at the center is like really good. Um, I did have pains in my shoulder for about a day or two after receiving the vaccine. Uh, basically what that meant is I couldn't really raise my arm above this height, right? So it was quite painful. And the day after receiving the vaccine, I did feel pretty tired. I had to lie down um, and a little bit of muscle ache and joint pain, but it's amazing how quickly it passes. So I don't, I didn't take Panadol. I didn't take anything. I just slept it off. And the day, and the second day after receiving the vaccine, I was basically back to normal. So if you, uh, I mean, something I found helpful, if at all possible, make sure you have some time to get a bit of rest on the day after you receive the vaccine, uh, especially if you're going for the mRNA vaccine. Uh, perhaps CoronaVac is a bit milder. I mean, I haven't really heard much about severe, uh, you know, reactions in that respect to people getting CoronaVac. So perhaps it's a bit milder in the system. But uh, the mRNA vaccine does, your body does tend to react to it. And that could be a good thing. I mean, it's part of how your body is actually processing the vaccine. And it's, uh, I mean, uh, all in all, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's part of a healthy vaccine response. So yeah, that's, that's my story. I can actually, if it's helpful, speak to the Sinovac vaccine, because that's the one that I ended up choosing for various reasons. And when I got the first shot, I also didn't really feel the needle. I guess the doctor that I went to just had really good technique. Um, after that, it was a little bit of pain in the shoulder. So I, like Sid, couldn't really lift my arm above here. But the first time around, it didn't hurt at all. Like I sleep on my left side and I managed to sleep on this side even after getting the vaccine. The second time around, the pain was a little bit more. So it hurt a little bit more, but not it wasn't that bad. And I think that I've never really had bad reactions to vaccines at all. So it basically hurt about as much as I expected, which wasn't a lot. And the only other thing is I had, maybe I had some runny nose as a symptom, but that was about it. And I also attributed it to, I thought it was related to seasonal allergies. So my experience with Sinovac is that it really didn't hurt at all. And I guess that the symptoms were a lot milder than what I've heard for BioNTech vaccines. Yeah, um, in my experience, it's same thing with Ben, Sid, and Ingrid. Like uh, the first dose, that it doesn't have so much um, effect. Like just only a little bit um, heaviness on my my arms. But after two days, I'm better. But the second one, I agreed that the effect is quite fast than the first first dose of the vaccine like i'm just sitting down waiting for my time to go out like i feel um the heaviness already on my arm then i feel like feverish but it's not i have the fever uh but uh because of fear i took um, um panadol and just get rested the second day and then on the on the next day I got better and then yeah, it's a good day. Can I can I ask something? Because uh, in domestic workers corner there are some members who have this um, lumps after they got the vaccine. So maybe um, some doctors here or Sir Ben can explain what they need to do to put hot coffee or something to help them relax themselves. So. Others, I get panic because, you know, it gets red and uh, swollen. So uh, any tips for those who will get vaccine, especially for the second, second dose? Thank you. Uh, 
Great. So a couple of other questions are coming in. I'm going to move us along in the interest in time. Um, so a couple of people are asking about. Sid, um, Sid, let, let Sid just reply to. Sorry, sorry. Let Sid just reply to the swelling. Sid, do you say something about the swelling? How to deal with if there's swelling yeah. at the injection site? Yeah, actually, the uh, something simple you can do is to take a cool piece of cloth. So just put it in the fridge for a little bit and just apply it to the site. Oh, okay. So a cool it's kind cool. of compress would help. Don't use an ice pack. That might be a little bit too cold. Just a cool piece of cloth. I, I don't, I mean, there's no evidence going against it, but I usually don't like taking um, aspirin, Panadol or mm -hmm. anti-inflammatory drugs after getting the vaccine because of how it might potentially interact with the vaccine response. So yeah, just go for something locally and mm -hmm. Don't worry, it's going to go away very quickly before you know it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sorry about that, Sid. Um, and so just a couple questions are coming in about frequency of vaccination. So for example, people want to know how many times they have to take it now. And will we be required to take this every year, like the flu vaccine? So I, I think what we've seen so far is unlikely that we're going to need vaccination every year because the response to the, the COVID vaccines is so strong. Uh, and even six months, nine months after people have been vaccinated, there's still a, a lot of antibodies uh, in, in those people who've been vaccinated. So my guess is we won't need annual vaccination, but we may need vaccination every three, four, five years, um, at least in the early days, maybe later on, it wouldn't even need that. And the other thing to, to be careful about is if there's a change in the virus, we've heard about the UK variant, the South Africa variant, the Brazil variant. If there's another variant, uh, which is even more different, maybe we'd need a slightly different vaccine to take care of that. But the vaccines we have at the moment seem like they can deal with those UK, South Africa, Brazil variants more or less. It may not be necessary to have a vaccine specifically for those, but in, in the future, if there's a new variant, maybe next year, there might be a vaccine that comes out specifically for that. Um, but otherwise, I don't think we, we'd need a booster dose too soon. Although we heard in, in mainland China, they were talking about how people who received the Sinovac vaccine might need a booster relatively sooner because it's a little bit weaker than the BioNTech vaccine. Excellent. Thank you. So a couple of questions have come in about what happens if people are seriously affected by the vaccination, for example, if they have very severe side effects. Uh, who do they reach out to for help? Is there someone that they should call? Who should they talk to? And for example, you know, is there any sort of compensation or help uh, that should come from the government for, for having received these vaccines? So right now you have had vaccination and you're one of the one in a tiny, a really tiny group of people one in a million maybe, if you're one in a million that has a really serious, serious reaction, then go to the accident and emergency department and, and tell them you've just had vaccination and you're worried that your symptoms are, are related to the vaccination. But there've been very few such cases um, in Hong Kong that I'm aware of. And then in terms of the compensation, if it's determined that your reaction is due to vaccination, then there is a compensation scheme, um, but that's a process to go through. In, in the meantime, you'd be managed in the hospital. But uh, I don't think it's really something to worry about. So far, we've heard about uh, a number of people going to hospital after vaccination from the vaccination centers, but that's because they're really very, very... Um, everybody has like increased heart rate after vaccination, maybe like me, they're just a bit, a bit panicky. And those people may be taken to the hospital, even though it's not really anything to worry about. And they get to the hospital and then the hospital just has a look at them and discharges them straight away. So. Great, so here's a question that came in that's interesting. So um, with regards to the Sinovac vaccine, um, here in Hong Kong, it's being given to people over the age of 60. However, back in the Philippines, oh, back in the Philippines where many people on this call are from, uh, currently that vaccine is not being given to people over the age of 60. Um, do we have any understanding why it's, it's potentially being given to people under the age of 60 in the Philippines? Yeah, so with the side of a vaccine, like a number of the COVID vaccines, when the initial clinical trials were done, they were done mainly in younger adults, not elderly, because that's the group in which vaccines are, 
maybe easier to, to, to start with, easier to administer, easier to follow up those people than elderly. And for some of the vaccine companies, it's maybe a, a preferable group to choose to vaccinate younger people because the vaccine is likely to work better in those groups as well. And for the sign of a vaccine, the trials have never been done in the elderly. So we don't know how well the vaccine works in the elderly. It probably does work. And the judgment in Hong Kong by the expert committee was that given the sign of that vaccine works in uh, adults below the age of 60, it's likely to work in older people. And if people have a choice between not being vaccinated or receiving the sign of a vaccine, then it should really be beneficial to receive the sign of that vaccine. Um, but I, I guess in other places, they've decided if they've got a choice of vaccines available and the other choice is a vaccine which has been proven to work in the elderly, then they'll tend to prefer that one to be used in the elderly and maybe limit the use of something like Sinovac in, in younger age groups. And I think even in the mainland, they may be waiting for, for more effective vaccines to use in their elderly. Um, so it's not clear. I don't think they're using Sinovac very much in their elderly in the mainland, in mainland China yet. Uh, and for the Philippines, maybe they're waiting for AstraZeneca or some other vaccines, uh, which are a little bit more effective to use in the elderly there. Excellent. So two related questions that have come in. So first, is it compulsory for people in Hong Kong to get the vaccine? And two, is it compulsory for people to take it if they would like to travel home to the Philippines or some other country? No and no. So it's definitely not compulsory. And I hope that it wouldn't ever be compulsory. I hope that it would always be a voluntary choice. Uh, for some vaccines in some settings, there are requirements for example nurses and doctors working in some hospitals in some countries have to get certain vaccinations for patient safety to protect patients against nasty infections but in in general populations it's very very unusual to hear about vaccines that are required except maybe in young children that uh, in some places when when vaccines are required to go to school so I, I don't think we'll hear about covid vaccines being mandatory in in most parts of the world in terms of traveling there's currently no um, no special policies for vaccinated travelers. I think in the future, it may be, uh, it may be sensible, it may be evidence-based to reduce quarantine for people who've been vaccinated. So the reason we have a quarantine in Hong Kong is to reduce the risk that COVID gets into the community by maybe 99%, a 99% reduction. So it, with, with something like a 14-day quarantine, if people have received particularly the BioNTech vaccine, but to a lesser extent, the sign of our vaccine as well, then that's already going to reduce the risk that they bring infection into the community. And maybe the quarantine could be accordingly shorter. But so far, we haven't heard of such a policy uh, from the Hong Kong government. I, I think maybe later this year that will start to be put in place. I really hope so, because I think it would make a big difference to people who want to travel. Excellent. So no plans yet, but um, in, if you are planning at some point in the future, it may make sense to think about getting your vaccine sooner than, rather than later. Um, so one question, so one question that's comes in, say I'm sick now, I have the flu, I have a cold, something pretty minor. Um, should I wait or, or should I just go and get my vaccine? If my appointment is say in the next couple of days, maybe Sid can take this one. Yeah, do wait wait and let your cold or flu or asthma attack or whatever, let it settle down completely. And then you go and get your vaccine. So when you're having an acute illness or something going on in your body at the moment um, is perhaps not the best time to get the vaccine. Just wait for it to settle and uh, then you can go ahead. So on that, if people are interested, uh, if you haven't had a chance yet, the, there is a website uh, Ingrid, maybe if you have a chance, you can pop it into the chat. Um, that's the site that you would use to book your, uh, your COVID vaccine appointment. It's a government website. It's actually really easy to use. Um, you will enter your information. You will sign up for your appointment. It will also provide you with a, a reference number for, um, for your appointment. If you use that number when you go back to the website, it's very easy to change your appointment. And currently there are a number of slots available. So it's easy enough just to push your appointment back by a couple of days. It's not, uh, it doesn't mean you're not gonna get vaccinated for weeks or months. It's actually quite flexible. So if you have any changes you need to make to your appointment, it's quite easy to do through the online website. Um, so one more question that has come in related to travel and, and, and vaccines 
if someone is coming here, so if someone is coming to start a new job here in, in, the, uh, in Hong Kong from the Philippines, are they required to get vaccinated before they travel to come to Hong Kong? No, no such requirement. Um, and I, I don't know if that would be a requirement in the future. It may be, there may be an incentive for people to avoid a longer quarantine, maybe to have a shorter quarantine if they've been vaccinated. But right now there's no special policy uh, for that situation. Excellent. Um, related also to our previous question about people with heart disease, what if you have cancer? Um, if someone has cancer, should they be uh, thinking about signing up to get their COVID vaccine? Maybe said you could take this one on. Yeah, uh, the, the problem with uh, conditions like cancer or autoimmune disease is that you may be on some treatment that actually makes your immune system weaker, right? So say you're on chemotherapy or you're on long-term steroids, that could actually affect the way you respond to the vaccine. But bear in mind that this is going to have an effect more on the efficacy rather than the safety. So I, I fully expect that the vaccines that we have in Hong Kong are still safe for um, this population. However, how effective they are is very difficult to say because this is a very um, diverse group. So the, uh, you know, because of... Uh, the different kind of chemo reg regimens or the different kind of steroid doses they're on, a lot of different factors affecting how likely they are to respond to the vaccine. My general advice is this group of uh, patients would do best to talk to their doctors first to decide on the timing of vaccination vis-a-vis -vis their treatment. So wait for the chemotherapy to be completed first for a decent amount of time before getting your vaccine or wait for the steroids to be you know, reduced if you're on a tapering dose before getting your vaccine. So just give your body the best chance to respond to vaccines by choosing the right time. And this is one of those situations where it's best to talk to your medical provider on um, choosing the right time for vaccination. Excellent. So those were all the questions. I'll hand it back now to Ingrid for final statements. And thank you so much to all the speakers for their, their answers to those questions. Great, so I want to thank everyone who tuned in today. We hope that we were able to answer at least some of the questions that you may have about the vaccination program. We'd also like to thank Dr. Sridhar, Professor Cowling, Sheila and Rogelia for taking the time to speak with you today. We hope you have a great rest of the day or staying safe and most importantly, taking care of yourself. Before we go, I would like to ask all of our panelists if they have any final words that they'd like to share with you or any final resources that they'd like to share. Get vaccinated. That's the final. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah no, Delia, any final thoughts? Thanks for everyone for sharing their perspectives on vaccination today. Great, so that marks the end of our webinar today. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>